when you're an emergency room nurse, your instinct is that you want to treat the most difficult case and the most interesting case, and you want to see everything. I think with that moment, as I was sitting with the family and sitting with the with the husband alongside the orthopedist who was, you know, they, the bullet was able to was I think just taken out of his leg right that right there in the trauma room, and yeah. he was being stitched up, and because he was he wasn't hurt as badly as his wife was. And as I'm sitting there with his family and him and talking to them and trying to keep them calm and letting them, telling them that I'll update them as soon as I get updates about his wife, I'll let them know and I'm there for them. Um, Like it hit me that sometimes the the correct place to be is not necessarily with the most difficult case and the most intense and most interesting case. Sometimes really you're there to be that support person for the person who's going through the worst day. Hello and welcome to the Art of Emergency Nursing Podcast. This is where we share stories for inspiration, entertainment, and encouragement, because we all know emergency nurses have the best stories. Now here's your host, Kevin McFarland. Hey friends, Kevin McFarland here from the Art of Emergency Nursing and welcome to the show. Thanks for listening to the podcast. I appreciate you as always. You may or may not know this, but May 6th starts National Nurses Week. So I thought, what better way to celebrate National Nurses Week than to interview international nurses from around the world? So I put a call out on social media and started reaching out to nurses from around the world. And I tell you, the response has been phenomenal. What you're going to hear today is the first in a series of international nursing episodes for the Art of Emergency Nursing. And my first episode... I have a listener who is from Israel. Well, she's not from Israel, but she moved to Israel, fell in love with the place, and now is going to share what it's like to be a nurse in Israel. You are going to love this podcast with my new friend, Shira. Well, I'm so glad that I'm so glad to get a chance to talk to you and hear a little bit about the system there and yeah. So you so you moved there and then became a nurse there. So you yeah. weren't you weren't a nurse in Canada. Yeah. After high school, I came to Israel for like a year just to see the country, travel, and I really I fell in love with the place. But my parents made me come back. So after a year, I went back to, to Toronto. I started a degree in biology. Like I didn't really I knew I wanted um, to do something in healthcare, but I wasn't sure mm-hmm. what was it, was it would it be medicine or nursing. I wasn't sure. And yeah. then that whole year, I was just looking into different programs in Israel and. Really, nursing really just spoke to me. Wow, that's and so cool. I came came back to Israel and went straight to nursing school. Why Israel? Um, so I'm Jewish, and we've always held that uh, we always see Israel as our homeland, a place just to mm-hmm. strive to to get back to. And uh, just from that one year, that one year that I spent in Israel traveling and meeting people, I just really fell in love. Like my heart fell in love with the country and the people. That's cool. And it's a difficult place to live in. It's not an easy place to live in, but. Uh, like I, I couldn't, I can't imagine myself leaving. I can't imagine uh, living anywhere else or working anywhere else. I, I got to admit, I know very, very little about it. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm super curious to hear what it's like there and what the healthcare system's like there and what it's like being a nurse there. Yeah. I'm super well, excited. Yeah. It's like I, a socialized healthcare excited. system. So that already makes it, you know, eons different from the States. Very different, very different from the States. Yeah. There is, um, and, and one of the things I found is, is that I found that difference in a few different places. And, and in a lot of the countries I've talked to and the, a lot of the people I've talked to in different countries are like, I can't believe America hasn't adopted this. There's just too much money in healthcare that, why, why, like, why would you switch this? Like, since Israel was declared a state in 1948, even before then, it was a socialized healthcare. Everybody had the right to healthcare. Like in my emergency room, I see patients who homeless people off the streets and people who are wealthy and are donors to our hospital. And both in the same place. Everybody in the same room, beds right next to each other. Everybody getting the same kind of treatment. And yeah. it's, uh, it's beautiful. So how, so how long have you been an emergency nurse? Since the beginning, since I graduated. Okay. So you started yeah. there as a new grad nurse? Yeah. That's awesome. I heard that's, that's like awesome. uncommon. I've been hearing more and more how uncommon that is. And I just, I think I just got lucky. It's not super, it's not super common here. I mean, we have, we have pathways for that now. Like if you, if you have a residency program, then, then you might be able to start um, where, where we kind of bring a bunch of people together and kind of bring them up together. Um, But a lot of, a lot of places really 
try to push to have a couple of years of med surge before you become an ER. Like, I understand that. Um, the way yeah. that my emergency department is built, I mean, it's changed since COVID, but since like before COVID, there was an area of the emergency room where they had like, we had 20 beds for patients where they already have a diagnosis and they're ready to start treatment, but they don't want to waste a hospital bed by sending them up to the department. So they stay mm-hmm. a day or two in the, in the emergency room. Yep. So that's where the new grads start. And you just learn to really understand what a, a patient looks like what a sick person looks like and what a healthy yeah. person looks like. And, yeah. and you work there for like six months before you go move out and work in the real emergency room. Gotcha. So, gotcha. Uh, okay. so at least you do, you do get some kind of med surge Almost experience. inpatient med surge area. Yeah. That's good. And short-term and short-term uh, patients. That's good. That's cool. It's a good way to do it. I mean, it, it makes it, um, it makes it so you're going to get, you know, you're not going to, because nobody wants to be thrown in with the like the sickest of the sick right away because you're you're going to drown and then you're going to you know it just crushes your spirit <laughs> just crushes your spirit because you're like okay I'm, well, I'm terrible at this and you're like no you're not terrible at this you just you, just, you, do, you just finished nursing school yesterday you just sat your board yesterday and right it's not ready you're to like, see real, real patients and as yeah. many patients as you saw when you were in nursing school and you're doing your rounds and your practicum it's not the same as when the responsibility is it's all yours. All you. All yeah. yours. Yeah. Yeah. That that's yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that's one of the things that, that um new grad nurses tend not to you know, I, I talk to new grad nurses all the time and, and we, I run a I help run a residency. So we have um 14 new grad nurses at two different hospitals. Mm-hmm. And um and we and that's in, in, in our latest group and we have three three groups kind of going, one's almost finished, one's kind of in the middle and one's uh, just starting. And I talk to them all the time. And one of the things I always tell them is like, you know, they were, they were telling me the other day, they're like, oh man, I, I feel like, I, I feel like I'm not getting this. I'm like, you've been on the floor three weeks. Like you're not. It took me like, years until I felt confident that I see a patient, I know what his problem is and I know how to treat him yeah. with full confidence. It took years, it took years, years of yeah, and, and That's right. And that's still, right. I'm still learning. I tell them over all and over and over. I say, guys, it's going to take you at least two years to where you feel like confident. Yeah. And then, and then, and then you learn enough that you're like going, really, I don't know a whole lot. I need to know more. Listen, I started so, doing a course in, uh, in emergency medicine. It's an advanced practice course, but it's not for a nurse practitioner or anything. Cause that doesn't exist here, but I just I'm learning so much. And that's when I really hit me how little I actually know. Yeah. I'm like, wow, how, like, I mean, how did anybody give me a responsibility to treat these patients when I don't know anything? <laughs> I think every emergency nurse goes through that at some point in their career that like going, I don't know anything. So, <laughs> <laughs> so why, why emergency nursing? Um, I was, I like, I enjoy learning and I wanted the experience of learning every day, single day of work. I wanted to learn something and I wanted to also, what I also, um, if, when you come to the emergency room, a patient comes, this is their most difficult day of their lives. Absolutely. The emergency room, our emergency room is crazy. You could have, we could have, have, you know, 80 to 100 patients in the emergency room at any given time. And Ooh. it's noisy and it's crazy and it's stressful. And the pa- like, I wanted to be there, the person for the patient, the person that the patient feels is there for them. And I can keep That's them awesome. calm and to keep things organized for them. So that way this day, maybe the worst day of their lives that they'll remember it is uh, the nurse who took care of me took really great care of me and that's cool calmed my fears and made me feel better that's awesome of course the action it's interesting every every case is so different every case is so fascinating yeah really i learn a lot every day absolutely that's that's what i love about emergency nursing is you're you're constantly learning you never know what's going to come through the door yeah, I just look at my I look at my watch, expecting I go, like, oh, it's only been two hours. So I look at my watch, eight hours have gone by. Yeah, you're like, time wow. flies. Time flies. Mm-hmm. That's a good thing. So, tell me a little bit about the healthcare system in Israel. So you mentioned that it is a, a social a socialized medicine. Yeah. So in Israel, mm-hmm. by law, every citizen needs to be registered for what's called a health fund. Um, there are four major health funds in Israel, and when you're registered for this fund, all the healthcare that you need. Um, falls under the, the fund. You go to your clinic that belongs to the specific fund to see doctors, to see uh, therapists, and you know, occupational physio, um, specialized doctors, like 
dermatology, endocrinology, whatever you need, you find a doctor in within your um, within your health fund. Mm -hmm. So no person is left without a doctor. Every single person has a primary care physician who manages their health care and sends them to specialists uh, as needed. Um, you could also pay to have you know higher levels of health care within your health fund or to go private for even additional procedures and things that aren't covered by um, by the health funds, but mostly everything is covered by health funds. No person can claim that the reason that they're sick or they don't take their medications is because they don't have money for it. Medications are mostly covered by by the government. You pay out of pocket, you pay a very small copay for medications, a very small copay for doctors and specialist visits. Same for surgeries. You go to a public hospital, your surgery is mostly covered. Wow. An emergency cool. room visit is free as long as you have a referral from a doctor. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That, and and as long as you have a referral from the doctor. So that means the doctor phone. is You're already You pick up the phone, you call um, the hotline for your health fund, you explain your symptoms, there's a nurse on the line, and she can approve. She can approve whether your situation needs immediate uh, attention, and she'll send you to the emergency room. She'll fax or email uh, a referral to the emergency room, or she'll say, no, I think you can wait tomorrow morning to come and see your doctor. Oh, very cool. Yeah, to have a nurse to make that decision. That's also it's amazing. A nurse can make that decision for a patient on the phone, whether or not they need to see a, to be in the hospital right away. I mean, there's some yeah. cases where you don't need to need a referral for, you know, somebody's had, somebody over the age of 40 who's having chest pain can come to the hospital without a referral. Nice. If an ambulance takes you to the hospital, you don't have to pay for the hospital, the emergency room visit. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. Does that keep like minor, like, like silly stuff out of your emergency department you having that think, referral system? You would think a lot of cases that come in, mainly like the young people who want to get sick days off of work or um, soldiers who want to get sick days out of the army. And they don't feel like waiting a long time to go see their doctor because the doctor, you can't pull anything over a, a doctor. The doctor will be like, you know, you have a cold, go to work. But you come yeah. to the hospital with a cold, the doctor just wants to get rid of you because he has a million other patients to see. So he'll just uh, sign you sure. a sick note and... So we see, we see a lot of that. The thing is, that's, I think, one of the advantages of what we saw with COVID, when people were avoiding coming to the hospitals because they were scared. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't see any of these, you know, ingrown toenails and minor coughs and colds because people were too scared to come to the hospital. And How that's when we finally saw the real, really sick people. It, that's what we found, too. We found our volume went down, but our acuity went way up. Like, yes. the acuity, they were, they were sick people. Like, because people weren't going to the emergency department. Like if they had like something minor, they were like, I'm not, I'm not going to the ER for that. Yeah. Like I'm going to go there and get COVID. And you know, the reality was, it was like, we're going to take care of you and we're going to keep you safe. But, right. but holy cow. Scared. it's uh, Yeah. People were scared. Like so, already by the second wave by, let's say by June, July, people were sort of slowly filtering back in. But we saw a lot of the uh, long-term effects or short-term effects of people who weren't seeing their primary care physician because they were scared even to go to the clinic to go see their doctors, yeah. right? So, you know, somebody would come up, come with, you know, uh, um, exacerbated CHF because they just, you know, they ran out of their, their Lasix and they were too nervous to go to a pharmacy to go renew their prescription. Yeah. So they went, you yep. know, a month not taking their diuretics mm. and ended up in the hospital. So we, see a lot, we saw a lot of that. Uh, in, in America too, like in America, that was, that was like the story. Like the story was like these people who avoided getting healthcare for so long and now they're super sick. Now they end up like in, you know, in trouble. So how, how bad was COVID there? Did you guys get hit pretty hard? Um, first wave. Well, so I think the first cases of COVID got to Israel around the end of February last year. Okay. Um, they came in from wherever everybody else got it, Japan, France, Italy, and the slowly but surely it's just started spreading. Um, the cases hadn't really entered the hospitals. And then I think we, like the Ministry of Health predicted, like they looked at other countries and predicted that we're going to see this COVID spread like crazy. So in order to become prepared, we went into a two-month lockdown starting at the beginning of, I think, the beginning of March. I think March until May last year, we were in complete lockdown. Once I locked down, everything was closed. Schools, malls, um, public transportation, gyms, clubs, everything was closed except for hospitals and uh, pharmacies and supermarkets. Everything else was closed. 
Wow. You could only go yeah, to your doctor or dentist on an emergency basis. Mm-hmm. Yep. So if that was, I think, just to buy, it was like a way to buy us time to like stock up on equipment, on PPE and ventilators and build COVID departments. Yeah. And that's exactly what, that's exactly what America tried to do too, is like they, but uh, you know, the, the problem that America had is it's such a big country and like some states really locked down and some didn't, some were like, man, it'd be okay. So, so because it's a small country and there's a huge military presence, they were able to lock down and enforce it. Yeah. There'll yeah. be like officers, police officers and soldiers standing at the ex- exit of every small town and every city on the highways. They built checkpoints along the highways to confirm that you were going somewhere, your tr- your travel was considered essential. It took, I thought that like, it would take me so quick to get to work because there would be nobody on the street, but then I'd be stopped multiple times on my way to work to confirm that I'm like, actually a nurse going to work, going to a hospital. Yeah. Wow. But I guess that's, if you're going to lock down, you got to enforce it. Right, but that, that was the only one that was enforced because I think people just got sick of it afterwards. So we had two more lockdowns since then and the other two weren't as strict like essentially with the other, the second and third lockdowns, um, only schools were closed. Yeah. yeah. And Israel has a, a fairly large population for as small as it is, does, does yeah. it not? Yeah. So, which is why when COVID did really hit bad after that lockdown, it spread really quickly, especially among communities where there are, that are hugely populated. Like towns yeah. where um, you have large populations and it's very small living quarters, family, there are many, like, in Israel, the average family size is larger than, than in the States. You know, the average family has, you know, at least three children. Wow. There, there are families that have, could have nine, ten children. Holy or cow. generations living together in the same home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, even if the home is big, if you have a few generations living in the same home, one person comes home with COVID, that's Everyone's it. The it. whole family gets gets it. Whether the children, the parents, the grandparents, the great grandparents. Yep, everybody. Then we'd everybody. see the grandparents in the hospital. For <laughs> the first couple of ways, it was mainly we kept, we had cases of all ages, not kids, but mainly uh, like young adults and elderly. But the elderly were hit hard. Yeah, yeah, they were really hit they hard. They were very like the survival rate wasn't great. No. I, and I think that's everywhere. I think everywhere found the same thing. And, and now it seems like the survival rate's going up, but it's it's still like, you know, it, it, the, the hard part is, is people aren't just aren't taking COVID as seriously as they were, you know, a year ago. Um, here, everybody knows somebody that had COVID or died from it. Yep. Um, yeah. but I, I think what's incredible is that I'll see patients come back to the hospital like the regular nursing home patients that every emergency room gets, you know, in nursing homes, in Israel, nursing homes aren't able to give uh, IV medication. They're not allowed to put, they're not allowed to place an IV. Oh, in okay. Homes. So if a patient in a nursing home has a fever, they just send them to the hospital. And then they end up staying in the hospital for a few days with, you know, UTI, pneumonia, the regular, uh, the regular things. And I'd see, I'm seeing now so many people over the age of 80 from nursing homes, bedridden patients from nursing homes, who survived COVID. It's crazy. It's incredible. And I didn't realize how many people survived COVID until until now. And I'm seeing all the people who survived it are coming back with whatever else they would have had. Yeah. So last year, instead of having pneumonia last year, they just had COVID pneumonia. Yep, exactly. And and I we haven't seen a whole lot of flu. Have you guys seen a whole lot of flu? Uh, not, not, uh, not at all. I don't think that, I didn't do a single flu swab this year, actually. Like, yeah, no, I, and, and, I and part of that's really probably because we, you know, we see you with the symptoms, we assume it's COVID. Yeah. And it's like almost, it's like almost like everybody forgot about flu for a little while. Right. But, but like the flu really went down just because everyone was wearing masks. Yeah. Like everyone was wearing masks. It, like, are, is, is everyone still in Israel still wearing masks? Are they still being good about that or? Um, well, since we started vaccinating at the end of December, and okay. that was our that was in the middle of our third wave, and we had just gone into a third lockdown. Wow. We're talking about like ten thousand cases, new cases a day, difficult cases. This third wave was, I think, the most traumatic professionally to experience because there were so many young people who got sick. We're talking late forties, early fifties, 
Yeah. We have to tell them we need to we need to ventilate we need to intubate you because you're not going to survive if you don't you're going to tie yourself out from this coughing and this this breathing. We need to vent like no 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 I'm not doing it. I'm not going to survive if you if you <laughs> intubate me I'm not going to make it up. And then yeah. like, young people but and the uh, death toll went up like crazy in the third uh, in this third wave. Wow. A lot of also pregnant women were considered high risk in this third wave. Wow. And so the um, the introduction of the Pfizer vaccine corresponded with this peak in cases. And uh, what's incredible is a month later, after like the, the vaccine was introduced for healthcare workers and uh, over 80s. So wow. a month later, when all these over 80s and healthcare workers were fully vaccinated, suddenly we saw this drop in cases. Huh. It was incredible. It was, just, it was just proof that this vaccine works and it's effective, not just yeah. in preventing uh, severe illness and also preventing spread. It, which, which, which vaccine are you guys using? Uh, you guys Pfizer. Using? So, Pfizer. They're trying to get Moderna also, but so far it's just been Pfizer. Just been Pfizer. Yeah. Because because Israel, I was just I was just looking at this. Israel was like one of the first countries that really started like putting out studies about it. Like really yeah, started kind of we, looking we were at just it. one big uh, research study. This country. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I'm happy to be, I'm happy to be a subject in this research if it means I can get the vaccine first. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like they would have, there were, there were reports of the clinics having extra vaccines at the end of the day and people waiting in lines to go. Yeah. Like my husband went to a different city to get vaccinated before he was officially eligible. And he's like, I'm going to wait for an end of day, the vaccine, leftover vaccine at the end of the day, because I want to be vaccinated already. And I think at this point I read recently, I think I read last week that 60% of the Israeli population is completely um, vaccinated for COVID. That's great. That's and awesome. We're saying the, what's the remaining 40%? The remaining 40% has got people under the age of 16, which Pfizer doesn't recommend being vaccinated yet with their vaccine. Yet. And people yet. who, yet, right? Yeah. And people who already had COVID because they're not pushing people who are immune because they already had the disease to get vaccinated until they're six months post, uh, post disease. Yeah, post disease. Yeah. So I think we've yeah. already, it feels like we already hit uh, herd immunity. That's so maybe cool. a, an average of a hundred new cases a day, but mild, mild cases. Like in my facility in the COVID department, there were only seven patients. At the wow. peak, we had a hundred. Holy cow! It's wow. it's incredible. It's like this new reality. Like we're, we see we see the end, or maybe this is the, the end. Maybe the this end is a new time. reality now. Like we yeah. still have to wear masks. Masks are still uh, enforced. Still a thing. Indoors. Yeah. It's good. But uh, yeah. like, is this the end? Is this the new reality? Like we're going just. A new reality of wearing masks all the time. You know, I mean, China's been doing it for how long? China's been doing it forever. They've forever. Been, they've, they've been wearing masks. And I hope that's not the new reality. Because I, I don't like it. I mean, I've, I've gotten used to it. Um, but I, I'd much rather not wear a mask. But like I now I don't see why. I don't know why you would be in a hospital. Why, why Like working on a hospital, I don't know why you'd be in a hospital and not wear a mask. Yeah. Like it, it, it just seems to you know, just offer that little bit of protection that could be the difference between like either getting sick or not, whether right. it's COVID or anything else. Yeah. But this, I tell you, the second that I was considered immune from COVID, which is like a week after the second shot, I ditched <clears> that <throat> N95. Like I'll wear, I'm wearing a surgical mask now. No more N95 for me. Yeah. <laughs> those we do yeah, eight hour shifts tough. here. So I'd be wearing an N95 straight for eight hours. Yeah. And it's exhausting. And you would feel like, I would just feel myself getting agitated. Like, why am I feeling like this? Like, I'm not that kind of person. And I'm really right. I haven't been breathing properly for eight hours. Right. And this is why I'm feeling like this. And yeah. and so many, and, but, and so many healthcare workers have been like, like, I know a lot of healthcare workers have been anxious and like antsy and, and everything with, with, since COVID started. And it's just, I think we, we feel more vulnerable than we have in a really long time. And because with, with I, I saw that really, and telling you, it's a miracle that I didn't get sick. I don't. I wouldn't say that I was any more careful than any of my coworkers. But a yeah. huge amount of nurses and doctors that I work with got COVID either from work or from community exposures, but mainly from work. And we wear <laughs> N95s. We had no shortage of PPE from day one. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, because it's Israel, we don't have to go by FDA rules. So. Obviously, N95s ran out really quickly, so we got KN95s or the or the FFPs from Turkey, the KN95s yeah. from China and the FFPs from Turkey. Yeah, 
apparently they worked because I was exposed to hundreds and hundreds of COVID patients and I didn't get sick. So most of worked. Knock on, knock on wood. That's great. That's yeah. good. Holy cow. Oh, what other kind of stuff do you, what, what other kind of stuff is common in your emergency department? Like pre COVID. Pre COVID. Kind of I mean, and also like post COVID because now we're seeing. Yeah. And yeah, now we, we already, we already got to the point where we don't swab anybody for COVID unless they were not vaccinated and didn't get sick and didn't have COVID really? past. Huh. Interesting. Because now if, cool. if a patient has a good reason for a fever, we don't assume that it's COVID. Assume that it's something else or maybe just regular pneumonia. Interesting. Yeah. That's cool. That, that is a, that's a different Amazing. world now. Yeah. It's a so what do we see in our emergency room? Um, how big, how big is your emergency room? Um, we have officially, there are about 80 beds, but we could have Ooh. well over a hundred patients at any given time. Yeah. Do hall beds, beds in the hall. hall bed, and, beds in the hall. Yeah. There's very few rooms. When I say there's 80 beds, it's not 80 rooms. It's maybe like 80 spaces. 20, yeah, 80 spaces for, for patients to lie. Um, yeah. They're all numbered. We're complete, we're completely uh, paperless. So it's very easy to keep organized and with follow-up with the patients. It's good. Um, we on an average day, I think we I think we have between 150 to 200 people come in in 24 hours. Yeah, that's busy. Most, of, most of whom are sent home, obviously, because most people come for you know single treatment and then they're stabilized and they go home. Um, but we, what we usually see, we see a lot of uh, patients patients from nursing homes. Like I mentioned before, um, if somebody in a nursing home spikes a fever, they don't just give them. Tylenol and then keep them, they send them right away to the hospital. And then we do, yeah. you know, from A to Z assessment and uh, usually end up keeping them. Yeah. I think yeah. that's mainly, it's yeah. not, it's not exciting. It's not, it's not mostly trauma. It's mostly just old sick people. Is your hospital a trauma center? Yeah. Level one trauma center. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Big hospital, <laughs> about a thousand beds. So in a thousand wow. bed facility in the heart of Jerusalem. It's a big hospital. Yeah. Is it the biggest hospital in the area or? No, there's one, another one that's bigger. Okay. But we're like the two main hospitals in the area. Um, it's just the big, largest city in the area. So we get patients from all the smaller cities, surrounding cities. Yeah. People will make, you know, a 40 minute trip to get to our hospital because we're the closest one that they have. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. It sounds like, it sounds like the hospital I worked at in yeah. New Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> sounds a lot like it. So, oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah, but of course, we had the usual um, chest pain, a lot of major chest pain and uh, strokes. We're also stroke center. We came a stroke center about, I want to say three years ago, four years ago. Okay. All right. So, you know, the stroke, we do a stroke code. Patient, uh, an ambulance will call ahead with a stroke code so, we, so the neurologist, can, neurologist CT could be ready for them. Fantastic. Yeah. Follow the That's protocol. Really cool. Patient would get TPA within like 30 minutes of arrival. It's incredible nice. to see how these changes happen so quickly. Went Isn't from no crazy? stroke patients and no neurology department to every stroke patient in the in the greater Jerusalem area. Wow, that's really cool. We, were, we I was talking to somebody just the other day about how um, they given TPA for the first time, and they're like, "It's the coolest ride ever!" Like you came in with deficit, couldn't speak, couldn't talk, and and then left able to talk feeling better, much less deficits. And I'm like, yeah, it's really cool when it works. Yeah. So. And we never, I never saw that before because yeah. we weren't, we didn't have a neurology department. So yeah. any, for any stroke went to the Shut other big hospital in the city. Yeah. yeah. Now I think that they're upset that we're stealing all their patients. <laughs> like you can have them. We have enough to work, enough to do with. Like, we're good. We, yeah. We're not looking for new patients. That's funny. Tell me about a patient that changed the way you practice. Oh, it's a good question. I think about two years ago, um, there was a terror attack in a city near Jerusalem. A terrorist uh, drove by a bus stop full of people and shot at all the people waiting at the bus stop. Oh my except gosh. like seven or eight people were injured, and uh, two two of the people came to our hospital. Um, a young couple, the woman, a woman and her husband. A woman, the woman was shot in her in her stomach, and her husband was shot in his leg. The woman was 30 weeks pregnant oh. and she was delivered in an emergency C-section and oh. I was uh, given the responsibility to take care of the husband. And uh, he, it turned out that he was from an English speaking family. So we bonded and I'm doing the best that I could to 
keep him calm because obviously he went through just went through the most traumatic event of his life and he was worried yeah. about his wife and his unborn child. And I'm doing my best to keep calm because this was, this was a great, everybody was so scared for this woman and the baby. Yeah. And of course, I think when you're an emergency room nurse, your instinct is, is that you want to treat the most difficult case and the most interesting case and you want to see everything. I think with that moment, as I was sitting with the family and sitting with the, with the, with the husband alongside the orthopedist who was, you know, they, the bullet was able to, was, I think, just taken out of his leg right, that, right there in the trauma room and yeah. he was being stitched up and because he, he wasn't hurt as badly as his wife was. And as I'm sitting there with his family and him and talking to them and trying to keep them calm and letting them, telling them that I'll update them as soon as I get updates about his wife, I'll let them know and I'm there for them. Um, like it hit me that sometimes the, the correct place to be is not necessarily with the most difficult case and the most intense and most interesting case. Sometimes really you're there to be that support person for the person who's going through the worst day of their life. And that's really what changed. I think that's one of those things that changed, changed the way that I work because sometimes I'm just so busy caring for all my patients. And at any given time, I could be treating between 14 and 16 patients who are under my care at any given time. And sometimes I really just need to take that moment and instead of rushing from one patient to the next, to be there for that one patient who needs me and to sit there and explain to them what's going on, what, the, what their diagnosis is, what their treatment is and what the, what the plan is and what, they're, what to expect. Well, I can't even imagine that, that poor guy, like here he is, he's shot and he's not that bad in, in a bed next to him or, or real close as his wife shot in the abdomen and his newborn child coming out unexpectedly, unplanned. Mm. I can't even imagine what was going through his I can't, head. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't imagine what he went through, but I hope that <sighs> maybe I helped him get through those few hours until he was able to be reunited with his wife because his wife was, she was delivered uh, in an emergency C-section and she was sent course right away to intensive care and he was just in a regular department waiting for to, waiting to be allowed to see his wife yeah and unfortunately the the baby passed away after just three days that's too bad severely oxygen deprived you know, the bullet hit yeah. the uterus of you know oh, such a such a tragedy and you just and you feel it because as also as a young person i uh, would feel like what if you know I, I take public transportation what if that were me and why would that were my family that was just destroyed in a minute? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. It, it, now, you mentioned um, terrorist attacks there. That seems to be something that, that happens not infrequently there. Yeah. Is, uh, that's and, the and I, I don't, that uh, you get used to. <laughs> let's let's talk can we talk a little bit about that because i like i don't know like so please uh, i'm i'm uh, ignorant like i don't know what it's like there but it seems that i, I seem to, to feel like I, I hear of things like that happening frequently right i mean i guess we would say more frequently than other countries but when you once you live yeah. here then you hear it becomes less and less reported in the news unless it's something something really really interesting like if a soldier were stabbed in the back by a terrorist that's passing by Unfortunately, it doesn't make the news because it's a, it's unfortunately a regular occurrence, but bad. it does happen. And we see those soldiers who make it to the emergency room with a knife sticking out of their back, right? It doesn't make it to the news until the person dies, if that were the case. But usually I think that we do a pretty good job saving lives. And hopefully most of these people end up out and being released from the hospital with minimal, minimal injuries and minimal damage. That's awesome. But uh, I've seen my fair share of uh, terrorism in the years that I've been working in the emergency room. I bet. I bet. We're prepared. We're always, always prepared. Every year we have to do a, we're required to take a course in uh, mass casualty events and how to prepare for them. And there's a complete game plan in effect for what to do if we receive 10 patients at one time or 20 or 30 or 40, how we empty out the emergency room in preparation to, to receive all these patients. Does that happen frequently there? Like, no, did you get mass in the years, in the, I, th I think in all the years that I've been working, working six years, we've only had one mass casualty event end up in our in our facility. And how many were that? Do you remember? Were there probably close to at least maybe around fifteen people who came in? There was a, a bus bomb. Holy cow! But thank God, over the last few years, really, like the amount of large events have gone down. 
the counterterrorism in the country is very effective. They know what they're doing and they stop things before they happen. What is it like I, think said, I think though in that event, I don't think anybody was actually killed. People were severely injured, burns mainly, yeah. and PTSD, of course. Oh my God! I'm just, like I, yeah, I can't so imagine this the whole one has really PTSD. a really nurse. I think it was like six years ago. I was really fresh, fresh out of nursing school, and I did not. I wasn't asked to go treat any seriously injured patients because I was not equipped, like professionally, to deal with that. But to be there for somebody who's going, who is going through flashbacks as as you speak, like it happened a half an hour before, but they're already experiencing the flashbacks. And as a new nurse learning to deal with that and how to sit with the person and hold their hand and be that person for them because they don't need any medical care. They need yeah. emotional care. Yeah. How, how does that, I mean, how does that feel to, uh, I can't imagine how it feels to live in a place like that where, where that's part of the reality. Part of the reality is that terrorism is, is alive and well. And, and I'm in the middle of Texas, like terrorism is, is a, is a thing. Don't get me wrong, but terrorism isn't on my top 10 list of things that I may have to deal with in my, in my lifetime or in my, you know, anytime recent. I think you compare it to like street crime. Like, so we don't have very much crime. Just your yeah. average crime doesn't exist so much. So instead of mm-hmm. having a drive by shooting of gangs, it's terrorists yeah. who shoot at uh, innocent civilians. It's a very, it's a, I guess a different, it's a different motive for sure. Yeah. But I think in terms of the quantity of people who are injured in, in shootings and stabbings, I would imagine it's the same. I never checked the statistics, but I would imagine it's the same yeah. kind of yeah, um, maybe about the same. I was talking to you, I told you I've been talking to international nurses from around the world and, and, um, one of the things that I, I was talking to one lady and she goes, I said something about shootings or stabbings. And she's like, I've only seen like two stabbings. And she's like, I've never seen a gunshot wound in my career. Oh, wow. And I'm like, it sounds like a dream. I'm like, wow, that, that was like, that's kind of crazy. And she's like, yeah, she goes, no, she goes, we get trauma. She gets, but our trauma is usually like MVCs and, and that kind of thing. She's like, she's like, I've taken care of like one stab wound. She goes, I think I, I know of maybe four. She goes, and I've never seen a gunshot wound. And I'm like, I don't even work in the emergency department. And I've seen a gunshot wound this week just walking through. Like, it, like that's, to me, that's not a... I think that in the last few years, though, many of the gunshot wounds and stabbings have been kind of uh, within families, like family feuding, and not necessarily uh, terrorism or gang-related or anything like that. Funny. Because that's yeah, the first just, thing you do is you ask them who stabbed you or who shot you. And they know who it was who shot them and stabbed them. Yeah, so like, that already like brings down the level of concern because, okay, you know, this is a situation that we got under control. You bring in the police, obviously, you know, the police, if it's among people in villages that don't want the police involved, they won't talk to the police. They're like, no, no, I'll deal with it. And <laughs> let them deal with it however they deal with it, you know, yeah, <laughs> between the family. Yeah. yeah. They want to get involved. Yeah, that's I I, I I understand that, and it's one of those where you're like, okay, well, then what's going to happen to this poor guy <laughs> if we don't get the yeah. police involved? Well, listen, if, if it was among families, and it was probably if one guy was shot, he was probably also holding a gun, right? They're probably shooting at each other. Yeah, that's probably true. That's I don't want to say my level of sympathy goes down, but it's like, well, yeah, why were you shooting a gun at your cousin? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why was your cousin shooting at you? <laughs> <laughs> right. What did you do to deserve this? But they they appreciate it. we joke we we do that though we joke and they're they're in the trauma room and they're like stressed out because they have a bullet bullet wound in their leg and you know I just see I feel like I see miracles every day this bullet that did not hit you know you do an X ray it didn't hit anything important and uh, you would just joke with the person oh so who shot you. Why did he shoot you? What did you do to deserve that? And then they start laughing because, you know, they realize what kind of ridiculous situation that they're in that they ended up in the hospital over a, I don't know, like over a family argument. Squall. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of crazy. I, 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 I'm the same way. I like to use a little bit of humor and be like, seriously, what happened here? <laughs> like, to be I able think, to laugh I think about patients it. appreciate that because they want to be looked at like a person so and not just another body on the table. Yeah, I think I think so too. I think it's um, I think it's always funny to to see people 
you, you see them lighten up a little bit where you're like, if you just kind of crack a joke or just be like, a, you know, just be friendly and be like a, a smiling face that's there to help. And um, that really will, will a lot of times I think put them at ease. So it took me time yeah. to get to that point. I think at the beginning, I was just so stressed and worried that I was going to do something wrong that uh, I couldn't be calm. I couldn't be the friendly person that I wanted to be. Yeah. It took a few yeah, years I, to get I, there. Yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me at all because I know because you're you're just too worried to make sure you don't screw up. Yeah. Listen, I was also practicing in a, a foreign language. I mean, I went to nursing school in Hebrew, so I picked up the language during school. But to go into the workplace and feel like I'm always missing something, like the nuances of the language, because I wasn't 100 percent fluent at the point when I started working. Yeah. And and how was how was that to go to a new country and where you where you didn't speak the language and and be in that environment like i mean what how brave must you be like I know, crazy. did you go alone did you go alone yeah i went alone um i was uh, 19 years old and i knew i knew basic hebrew from i went to i went to hebrew school growing up 12 years of uh hebrew school so i had a very 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 basic level of hebrew i could read um and i could write but i didn't necessarily understand everything that i was reading yeah. and also uh i didn't necessarily understand anything that people were telling me and then nursing school was uh, was challenging. I lived in the dorms with Israelis. I was in, I was immersed in Hebrew twenty four hours a day. In the yeah. morning, I'd go to class, be in class for like seven eight hours, come home to my dorm, and also more and more Hebrew. And I think that was like what that things one that's one of the things that uh, helped me pick up the language quickly was just being immersed twenty four seven. And yeah. after class, every day after class, I would take my roommate's notes and copy her notes and look up everything. Tr- on Google Translate <laughs> to make sure that I was understanding. And it took some time till I figured out that all the textbooks were in English. So if there was any topic that I didn't understand, I could either just like look it up online or read up on in the textbook. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now the, the textbooks, the textbooks there at the school were in, in yeah. English? All the textbooks are in English. Is, There's is like English... the, the main, like the main nursing textbook um, was translate was loosely translated into Hebrew and they say they tell the students don't rely on that for the exam because we're testing you from the English version. So students are expected to have a high level of English. Okay. Now, do, do most people in Israel speak both languages? Um, everybody speaks Hebrew. Um, people who work in healthcare are expected to have a high level of English. Okay. When we talk diagnosis, we use the English words with an Israeli accent. So that's uh, interesting. Yeah. Like instead of I say pneumonia in Hebrew, they call it pneumonia. Huh? You're it's like, it's, it's oh. hilarious. I remember we're hearing that for the first time, and it's, it's hilarious. But that's uh, so. If you're an English speaker and you don't remember words in Hebrew, you just say it in English with a Hebrew accent, and uh, and you you're got it. They know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's kind of cool. How brave are you? Holy cow! Is your family still in Canada? Yeah, I haven't seen them in over a year. Holy cow. Yeah. Since COVID, go, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, COVID's putting the travel squash on everybody, yeah. right? Yeah. So, And your husband, is he from Israel? He's Israeli. Yeah, he's Israeli. He grew up uh, in Israel to uh, Canadian-born parents. His parents moved to Israel before he was born. Okay. Like, they got married in Canada and then uh, moved to Israel right after. And he was born, born and bred here. But he speaks English fluently because uh, he grew up in an English-speaking home. Do you have kids? Yeah. Two little okay. girls. Yeah. Two little girls. How old are they? Four and two. Okay. Are they learning Hebrew? Or are they learning English? Are they learning both? Well, we speak only. We're very strict about speaking only English at home. And then they have Hebrew. Okay. Where they go to school and they're immersed in Hebrew. But what's interesting is I live in a community where there are a lot of English speakers and also second okay. generation English speakers, like people whose parents moved uh, to Israel and then they, but they grew up speaking English at home, but living in Israel. So there's a lot of mix. So there's a lot of my daughters somehow managed to find English speaking friends. It's very interesting that they'll speak Hebrew to their Hebrew Israeli speaking friends and they'll speak English to their Anglo friends, which is interesting how they are able to figure out which kids speak English. Like, I don't right. imagine that they just walk up to other kids like, do you speak English? Like, yeah, but it's, it's, kids interesting. Are, it's incredible. Like my kids are, I mean, my four year old for sure is already bilingual. My two year old, she'll get there eventually. She's you know, just started talking, right? So. Four-year-old who's bilingual. That like, like I'm so jealous. 
after a few years, I felt after like maybe about just a year, actually, I felt I was lacking in Arabic because we also have a huge Arab population in Israel. Okay. And many, many Arab patients. And I, uh, most the women in general don't know Hebrew. Yeah. Most of the men do. Um, but most of the women don't know Hebrew. And I felt that I was treating patients and always have to have to refer to their husband, the husbands to help me translate. I felt that wasn't really appropriate. I think a, a patient needs to be able to speak one-on-one with their nurse. So I took a course in medical Arabic for about a year. Wow. I mean, it's still, I didn't continue because I didn't have time, which I regret because I really want to be able to speak Arabic fluently because I want to be able to communicate with my patients. Yeah. So I have like a, I have a, a glossary. I have a list of like phrases in Arabic. That's cool. Central phrases. Really cool. And I don't necessarily always understand the answers because once they think that I could speak Arabic, they start like <laughs> jabbering to me in Arabic. And I, you know, I I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't really speak Arabic, but I know like a few words here and there, a few phrases I used, to find, I used to find the same thing. I used to be able to do a triage in Spanish. Like I would know enough Spanish to, to do a triage, but then they'd start talking. And you're like, wait a second. Like, Slow down. Like muy, muy, muy piquito. And they'd be like, oh, okay. They're like, you don't really speak Spanish. <laughs> like, no, not really. <laughs> so, we always have somebody on staff that speaks Arabic. because They have a lot of Arab nurses and doctors and aides. So it's never really a problem to find somebody to help with the translation. That's cool. That's really cool. And always a person they call if they need a, a fluent English speaker. Yeah. Because even though nurses are expected to have a high level of English, some people just don't feel comfortable explaining to their patient what's going on in English or answering questions in English if they don't, if, you know, sometimes we've had English speaking patients, let's say from England, come in. So I'd have Israeli co workers who don't understand the English accent. Oh, <laughs> so they'd ask yeah. me to come help them. Yeah, they're like, I, they're like, I, I kind of know the words, but I don't get it. Like, yeah, it's not the English <laughs> I've heard on TV, so I don't really <laughs> interesting. really understand. Interesting. So I'm glad yeah. to be that person, you know. That's kind of cool. Translation. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm jealous because I, I, I wish I was more bilingual than I am and I just haven't put the time into it and I'm sure if I I'm sure if I put time into it I probably get it, it but so it's just finding the time that's really it which is why I never continued with the Arabic is because I just didn't have the time I went I went on to, to go do my master's and now I'm doing this course now uh from from what you know from from Canada and from what you know from from that different lifestyle how is our how are, are, are like women's rights, how are women treated in Israel or in the Arabic uh, population of Israel? Is there, is there a difference in kind of the, the gender roles there? Um, I mean, I think even just looking at our staff, you can see that there's still that huge division in gender roles. The nursing staff is made up mainly of women. The medical staff is made up, made up mainly of men. Um, here, like, it's not that if you're a woman, you're not allowed to go to medical school or if you're a man, you're not allowed to go to nursing school. But people are really mainly for the main part stuck to uh, gender roles. Okay. I mean, we have, we have quite a few male, like this year we got, we have uh, like 10 new uh, grads that start up, start up in the middle of COVID and yeah. five of them are five boys and five girls. So that nice. was already, we're seeing a change for the better and getting, making some changes within the nursing staff. Um, I think with in Israel, uh, family life is really highly prioritized among Jewish families, among Arab families, that women like go for jobs where they could be available for their families. And yeah. medical school is not an easy path. No. Especially thinking about internship and residency. Residency yeah, like, sure. residents do these shifts of like at least over 26 hours. Yeah, I don't crazy. like. I don't think that I would be able. Be, but people do it, and women do it, men do it, but fewer women do it because they take that into consideration if they want to have a family and they want to raise a family. Yeah, that they need to. They want to be available, even though, your- like, even though that um, I think that as a nurse, I'm not necessarily home for my family all the time between my shifts and sleeping off a night shift and sleeping before a night shift and coming home yeah. for a morning shift. Dog tired, and all I want to do is just collapse on the couch and go take a nap, but. My kids are home and I got to be there for them. So yeah. I don't think being a nurse really is any different from being a doctor in terms of working crazy hours and just being tired all the time. But in Israel, there are, there are a lot of laws protecting women in Israel in the workplace. Um, and for example, um, a, a pregnant woman starting from week 20 or something does not have to work night shifts and doesn't have to work okay. a shift longer than 12 hours. Okay. 
but you'll see a lot of pregnant doctors who are exempt from doing those 26 hour shifts because they're pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. We have a, <clears throat> we have a 15 week maternity leave by law. So yeah, which is also unheard of, unco- but unco- unheard of in, in the States. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That's, that's kind of cool. And you guys do eight hour shifts? Nurses eight do eight hour shifts. Hour shifts? We did okay. 12 hour shifts at the beginning of COVID. Um, I think first of all, because there was, there were no, there was no public transportation. So mm-hmm. nurses had to get to work somehow. So the hospital had to provide, had to provide cars for all the nurses. And it was cheaper for them to provide cars twice a day than three times a day. Yeah. That was like the main reason they went for 12, went for 12 hours. And then as time went on, more and more nurses were going into quarantine from exposures or more and more nurses were getting sick. So we were just so short staffed by so staffing um, shifts, 12 hour shifts, which is easier than staffing eight hour shifts. Yeah, right <clears throat> do you do a 40 hour work week or how long? How I do less. I do, you? I alternate between three, four shifts a week. Oh, okay. Three yeah. or four, uh, eight hour eight shifts. shifts. Yeah. That's not bad. And then do you rotate days and nights? It sounds like every week. If this is, I think, I think this is unique to Israel because I haven't heard about this anywhere else. Every week it's a different schedule. One week oh. I can work Sunday, Thursday, and Saturday. The next week I can work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. The next week, something totally different. Every week it's a mix of mornings and evenings and nights. Oh. Every week is a different schedule. Wow, that's yeah. tough. Yeah. <laughs> I think you just get used to it because then you can yeah. kind of coordinate your personal life around work or your work around your personal life. Like if I know yeah. that you know, my daughter has a doctor's appointment at a certain time on a certain day, I just, I know just not to book a shift for that time. That way I'm available for, uh, for my daughter for her appointment or for my own appointments or whatever it might be. Family events. Back when we did those family events, I could coordinate shifts around my, around the events. Do you guys have a busy time, a, a busy time of day? Like is like Mondays are always busy in the U S like just right, so, always busy. So here the weekend is Friday, Saturday. Okay. Well, Friday's not officially a weekend, but because schools don't have classes on Fridays, it kind of became a weekend. Yeah. So Fridays are usually relatively quiet and Saturdays are our quietest day. So even mm-hmm. though Saturday's a weekend and you want to be home with your family, uh, sometimes yeah. it's worth it to work because uh, you'll know it's going to be an easy shift. Yeah. Sundays are, well, Saturday, yeah, Sunday mornings are insane. And it goes yeah. all the way until maybe Tuesday, the insanity of the beginning wow. of the week from Sunday until Tuesday. It sounds like Monday. It sounds like Mondays in, in the U S mm-hmm. and Mondays in the U S you know, the day after the weekend is always like, it's always busy. Like yeah, Mondays. I think that was urgent on Saturday. It suddenly right. became urgent on Sunday. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sunday. Yeah. Suddenly Sunday it's urgent because they don't want to go to work on Sunday. <laughs> right. So then we get our drunks Thursday night. That's yeah. when we get our drunks. Yeah. Okay. Do you, is is alcohol and, and drugs a big problem in Israel? I've heard it's not relative to the states. I have a, a bunch of coworkers who came from the states, and they said this is nothing. Yeah. Very, okay. very, very few. We have a we have a drunk protocol, like drunk teen protocol. Okay. Um, I work in an adult emergency, so we don't see people under the age of eighteen. Okay. Um, so we have eighteen nine year olds that go out for the first time in their lives, going out to bars and drinking alcohol and getting drunk, and we encourage them to, with their, with they always come with a, with a companion and we encourage them to drink water. That's what we encourage them to do. So they don't have a hangover, but we do not give IV fluids okay. unless they're severely dehydrated and the vitals are no good. But yeah. generally we, you know, we check their blood sugar, check their vitals, monitor their blood sugar and vitals and uh, encourage them to drink. How old do they have to be to drink? They're 18. Yeah. Drink? yeah. Okay. And what about drugs? Drugs is not, it's not common at all. Really? Interesting. People who are, I find that people who are drug addicts have become addicted to, uh, when I'm saying with drugs, we're talking even prescription drugs, yeah. prescription narcotics. That's what you'll mainly see when I still see street drugs. Yeah, at least, street in, at drugs. least in my area. You'll see street drugs are more common like the Tel Aviv area. So in the Jerusalem area, it's more, when you come, people come in with drug overdoses, it's mainly of uh, prescription narcotics. People who have chronic, chronic pain will, would end up overdosing yeah. on, uh, on prescription drugs. Yeah, yeah that's not uncommon. Yeah. And like, like but it's marijuana. much less, much less common. It's not, it's not, I, I wouldn't even say that I see a case every day. Really? Maybe once a week. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. That's kind of cool. Great, yeah. Yeah, it's not a bad thing at all. Mm-hmm. So, 
Are there any differences that you've heard from the states to 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 uh, Israel? Um, I would th- I think that one of the uh, major differences that I've heard just from word of mouth. You can correct me if I'm wrong because uh, I never worked in the states. Um, in Israel, nursing is not an independent uh, profession. In every law related to nursing, nurses are always beneath doctors. A nurse cannot practice independently. A nurse can only work where a doctor is employed or like physically present. Interesting. Anything yeah, a nurse does, even though there's a long list of um, procedures and treatments that nurses are legally allowed to do, um, she can't do it unless a doctor gives an order for it. So the way to bypass that is, let's say, the the uh, medical manager of the hospital will say, every nurse in my hospital is allowed to, I don't know, for example, um, give Tylenol as an OTC medication. Yeah. So you don't need to wait for a doctor to write an order for Tylenol for you. You can just give it and you sign off it on your own. But um, so like this is also the reason why nurse practitioners, physician's assistant doesn't exist in Israel. There's a huge backlash from the Medical Association of Israel. Doctors don't want nurses to become more professional. They don't want nurses to have higher education or to be allowed to do more things than we're already allowed to because they're worried that we'll cut into their salary. Because yeah. as it is, I don't find that the healthcare system is is thriving and it doesn't get it doesn't get enough funding as it should as it should get. Yeah. Which is why do- we're I feel chronically understaffed. We we are we treat way more patients than it's safe to treat. In the emergency mm-hmm. room, the nurse patient ratio on a busy shift, I can be treating like 14, 15, 16 patients at one time. Holy cow. That's and I hear I have patients. friends who work in the States and they go crying after, well, I had six patients at once. Like six patients is a dream. I wish I only had six patients. I would sit with each patient and have a half hour conversation if I only had six patients. Oh my gosh. That's and they sometimes awesome. I feel like a chicken without a head racing from one patient to the next. And I bet they start so busy, like just mm. putting out fires. They're not treating patients. I'm preventing things from going downhill. Preventing death. And I wish that would happen. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like for, for, for most ER nurses, I would say, I would say most ER nurses were, were have either four to one, maybe five to one. Sometimes it'll go a little higher than that. You're like going, that's In med surge departments, I think there are one on, one on eight or one on nine. And they won't go more than that. They have their limit and they won't, they won't admit more patients over their limit. So then we get stuck with all these patients. Okay, that's universal. That's universal. (laughs) The ER is the place of last. For like 24 hours until they go up to the department. Oh yeah, that's, that's universal. Yeah. Um, same here. Now, now the nurses here would have a fit if they had eight patients. I mean, most of the time, most inpatient units are about about five, maybe six, um, but usually not much more than that. Like I said, the shift where I have fourteen, I won't say that fourteen of them are critical. Maybe only four of them are critical. Then I spend all my time treating those four critical patients, and the other patients get forgotten about. And yeah, it's uh, not ideal. Sting. Um, I worked full time for only for a very short period of time. I worked full time for like two years until my first daughter was born, and then I just couldn't do it anymore. It's so yeah. mentally draining and physically draining to work so much. Yeah. So you work three shifts a week, three, eight, well, three, eight, three, eight, three, eight, three, and then four. alternate four, yeah. three, and four. It's yeah. not bad. And at the same time, now I'm doing a course in emergency medicine, which is twice a week. So it's also more and time than not available. Does your hospital pay for that? Yeah, you pay for most of it, sixty percent of it. That's pretty good. I'm okay with that, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. And 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 tell me about this course in emergency in emergency nursing. Is it or emergency medicine? Is it a? Well, what's it like? What's it? What kind of stuff are they teaching you? Um, I'll say everything. I yeah. finally, I'm saying this is this is crazy. After six years of working in the emergency room, I finally understand EKGs like never before. Okay. I have, have a, really amazing. I'm doing it uh, in a nursing school in Tel Aviv. Um, but now it's on Zoom, so that's also great. It's kind of cool. For the time being, they're threatening to bring us back to the classroom, so we're we're all putting up a fight. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a really a course to uh, be go. We're learning about all the different disease processes in more depth than I learned in nursing school. And more pathologies. All these diseases, kind of- the disease, disease pathology, and disease processes and treatments that I do on a daily basis 
Now I actually finally really, really understand what it is that I'm doing and what is it, what it is that I'm seeing. Because you learn everything in nursing school, right? You learn every single topic. You learn med surge and you learn pharmacology and pediatrics and they don't teach they don't teach emergency nursing. They right. don't teach emergency nursing. And finally I'm actually learning what I'm seeing. And this is also coming from six years of experience, right? So I have six years of in person experience. Wow. Um, to finally come to come to the classroom and they're like, oh, that's what that is. And that and to make these connections. And why that's we give cool. this medication in this situation, not this medication in a different situation. Yeah. That's really cool. What a cool thing to be able to yeah. to be able to do. And like what a what and so how long is the course? How long does the course it's a, take? It's a one year course, um, about seven months of seven or eight months of in person learning. And then afterwards it's mainly simulations and uh practical work and we go to do our rotations in hospitals and other hospitals other than our own to see what other emergency rooms look like. We have to do a few shifts and shifts in pedi- with pediatrics, which nice. I don't work with kids usually. So it'll be, it should be interesting. A few yeah. shifts in the uh, intensive care unit. That's which will really, cool. really interesting. What and at the end, cool there's an exam. Thing. There's a written exam and a practical exam. Oh, that's really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, that recognized, can... it's recognized by the uh, Ministry of Health in Israel, but it doesn't, it's not, I wouldn't put it on the level of, you know, a nurse practitioner because it doesn't come with a degree. It comes with like a certification, but it's not a, it's not a degree program. Do most, um, what, what degrees do most nurses have in Israel? Um, every, every nurse has to have a bachelor's degree. Bachelor's degree. Yeah. Okay. If it, right. it, for a while, you could be a nurse and just get your RN without a bachelor's, but over the last uh, five years, they've just changed the entire program and that you need to have a bachelor's degree. Mainly nurses, nurses who go straight to nursing school from high school will go get a BSM. Um, but you do have the option that if you decide later on in life that you want to go to nursing school, which just happens to be a very uh, common, common practice in Israel, people will go study for towards a degree. And then after a few years realize that their degree doesn't mean anything. They're not helping people. They're not changing the world. And they'll go back to school for nursing. And there are programs available for people who already have bachelor's, bachelor's degrees to go back and make up the courses for nursing. That's awesome. Because in nursing, you do change the world. Yeah. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So people want a fulfilling job. Yeah. I have a I have a coworker who was a lawyer in a previous life. And at the age really? of uh, 30, she decided to go back to, uh, to go to nursing school. Wow. She thought that she wasn't really helping people as a lawyer, which is interesting. Oh. You think that as a lawyer, you do help people, but she just didn't feel, I think she was like in taxes probably. Yeah. She thinks she's yeah. in taxes. She yeah, didn't feel like she was helping people. She didn't feel fulfilled. So oh. with four kids, she went back to nursing school. Wow. That's and, cool. Uh, yeah. Now she works with me in an emergency room. I really that's hope cool. she's feeling fulfilled because there's no, no better fulfillment. Agreed. Agreed. hundred percent. What do you like best about being a nurse? Um, I like knowing that I have the, the skills and the knowledge to be able to solve people's problems when they come in through, through our doors. They That's come awesome. in, they don't know what they have. They have this pain or this discomfort. And I like, I've seen a patient like you. I know what you have. And to be able to start the assessment and blood work, send for x-rays and start treatment. And within, you know, 20 minutes, the patient could already be feeling better because I already got them started. I, you know, also hopefully calm them down and they feel that there's a kind person that's there for them during all this. That's cool. I love that. And that's the thing that, and that's nursing. That's what nurses do. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that, and, and talking to all these folks from around the world is that, that's the, the common thing. Like nurses always do that. And it's, you know, yeah. as, as one of my previous guests said, he goes, nothing changes, but the accent. I think right. that's true. <laughs> I see that too, yeah, for sure. That's true. Well, what I advice would you, pardon? what advice would you give a nurse who going into emergency nursing? Um, I would say, be willing to ask questions. Don't be scared to ask questions. I've heard from other nurses in other countries where, you know, nurses eat their young and people, new grads are scared to ask questions because they don't want to be attacked and they don't want to be tattled on by us. I don't want to think, I don't even think it's just my facility. I've heard it from nurses in other facilities in the country. Um, 
everybody is one family. Everybody's one team. We're all working together towards this greater goal of treating our patients and making our patients have the best experience possible in their most difficult time. So as a new, as a new grad, don't be scared to ask questions, understand what you're doing. Don't give medications without knowing what, what they're for. And if you're not sure, ask. Yeah. So is, is nurse bullying not a big thing there? No. Because it's, it's, it's sometimes kind of bad in America. It's terrible. I felt when I started working that I was welcomed with open arms. I was assigned um, one of the more senior nurses. We, uh, when I started, we were a group of like five nurses that started together. New grads that started at the same time. And we were assigned a few senior nurses. And part of their job was to welcome us onto the team. And we have, I mean, pre-COVID, once a year, we'd have like a get-together of the staff, as many of the staff that was, isn't working get together yeah. for, you know, a barbecue or for a hike outside and a picnic, just team building, team building events. Cause I think it's very important for my, for our manager too, that we're, that we're a team and that we're a family, even with, even with the doctors, with the, the, uh, the emergency medical residents, I feel like we have their, we have their trust, especially with nurses who are a little bit more senior. They know they can rely on us for everything. Yeah. And there's no reason to bully younger nurses because we want them. We want them to work with us. We want to Absolutely. be a team and we want more staff. We need more staff. So <laughs> right. or if the nurse is strong and, and he or she has the willpower to succeed in emergency nursing, we want them. Yeah. And we do what we can to help them out. That's, that's the way it should be. Like, I, I, wish, I wish it was like that everywhere. I don't know. Why bully? It's it's like, I mean, there's, there's no lack of jobs. Yeah. Yeah, we're all, yeah, we're all going to Does work. making another nurse look bad make you look better? I don't think so. Yeah, absolutely. One of the last questions I always ask my guests is a question called three things. So give me three things that an emergency nurse should always remember. And then three things they can just forget. Okay. I think always remember to take a breath. You know, it's the shift is only eight hours. It will pass and breathe. And remember that you need to breathe in order to help your patients breathe. Um, another thing, remember uh, to report, write everything down. Because as we always learned in nursing school, if it's not, if it's not written down, if it's not documented, it never happened. Absolutely right. That phrase also exists in Hebrew. So I guess it's one of those common phrases all across the board. Yep. Um, another thing to always remember is, uh, is be kind because even if you're exhausted after being on your feet for eight hours, you haven't had time to take a break to eat or even go to the bathroom, your patient just got there. And for him, you're the first pace person that you're seeing in this crazy mess of emergency room. So just remember to be kind. It's not their, their fault that they're in there and, uh, and to be there for them. Absolutely. And three things to forget. Um, forget it when a patient or a patient's family yells at you. They're stressed and you hope that uh, it's not personal. It's just because they're in a very stressful situation and they feel like they deserve um, quicker attention. And what they feel is what matters, right? So yeah. if they yell at you, don't take it personally, forget it and move on. Because it's not, it's not important. It's not worth having those negative feelings sitting with you. Because it could really ruin your whole day if you let it sit with you. So I would say the first Absolutely. thing is just forget when somebody treats you treats you poorly. Absolutely. Um, what else should they forget? What else should forget? Um, oh gosh. I don't know. I feel like most of my things just remember. Remember everything, right? <laughs> Fair enough. I don't know. Forget... Huh. I know that's a tough one. It's a tough question. It's a really tough question. So I feel like I'll go to bed tonight and I'll suddenly wake up like I know what else to forget. <laughs> be like, I got it. I got it. This has been a lot of fun. This has been oh this has been one of my favorite podcasts ever. It's just oh, thank you. such a it, it what interesting story you have and how interesting it is in, in a different country and hearing about different countries. This is you know, I, I say this podcast has been for my audience, but it's really been super for me. because It's been, oh my God, just incredible to hear all the differences. And I can't wait to hear all those podcasts. 
Anyways, Exciting. I can't thank you enough for your time. I really appreciate it. Right. So, right. It was cool. really great to meet you. It was great meeting you. hearing your voice for so long to actually uh, meet you. <laughs> to actually put a face to the voice. Right, for so, sure. Yeah. Anyways, well, thank you so much for listening to the podcast and thank you for uh, reaching out to me. And this has been a blast. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Art of Emergency Nursing Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Facebook. 